Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. I was at the park, my phone rang, and it was a guy called Jackson Oppie who ran the Hater Clinic. We spoke for probably 40, 50 minutes, maybe an hour. I probably cried for 80% of that time because he was extremely powerful. He was saying things like, continue this and you'll be dead in two years. Continue that and you'll lose your family. Or continue that and you'll be in jail because you'll hit someone while you're driving. So there's no mucking around here. Hello, I'm Drew Wennan. Welcome to The Recovery Project. My mission is simple. I want to share stories to inspire others to seek help. I have some exciting guests lined up ready to share their own story of recovery. Today in the first episode of The Recovery Project, I have Adelaide TV and radio veteran Mark Aston. Mark, welcome. Drew, thank you. A pleasure to be here. Where did it all start? Childhood. Tell us about your childhood. Yeah, well, I, ha- I had an unusual childhood. My first probably seven or eight years, I started living with my... Um, grandfather and grandmother and mum and dad. Uh, I've got Kathy, my sister, and and Rob, my brother. But we initially lived um, with mum and dad, and then for a particular reason, we needed to shift. And as a result of that, we shifted in with my my grandparents, who lived in Glenunga at the time. They were renting a a place in Glenunga. So... That was a little unusual, I guess. Uh, I mean, it was only a small house. Robbie hadn't been born then. And we sort of lived on top of each other mm. to a large degree. I mean, I I, I slept uh, with mum and dad and because there were only three bedrooms and, as I say, there wasn't a lot of room. That was a little different. It was a, it was a little unusual. But at the time, of course, I loved it. Mm. I mean, it was great fun. I mean, I was only... I was only five at the time when all of this happened and from five until about probably 13, 12 or 13, my life, well, I, I guess I had two sets of parents in a lot of ways, mum mm. and dad obviously, and I didn't see a lot of dad and mum who was unwell, uh, very unwell mentally and she wanted to look after me but she found that difficult and therefore I guess by default my grandmother and my grandfather, who sadly aren't, in fact, all four of them aren't with us anymore, they sort of looked after me. Mm-hmm. So from a from a, a traditional family values, family upbringing point of view, it was a little bit different. And and it was, and when I say mum was unwell, I mean obviously I know that now, but at mm-hmm. the time I didn't. I mean I was just too young. I didn't mm-hmm. understand that. Mum was still working during that period. But it was clear that she wasn't able to, bless her heart, but it was clear that she wasn't able to give me the the love that a good mother can give mm. their son. And and in that case, uh, you know, her daughter Kathy and then obviously Robbie came along. Dad wasn't there a lot, Drew. Mm. He, he was obviously working and so I didn't see a lot of Dad. And at the time, Dad was... He was the night manager at a hotel on, at a motel on Glen Osmond Road. So he'd work all night and then sleep during the day. Mm-hmm. So it was unusual from the point of view that I was living with two sets of sort of parents, but it was also unusual because my true parents, because of mum's un, her health condition and because I didn't see a lot of dad, then that in itself, that family unit wasn't what I feel now, thinking about it, many, many years um, into the future, wasn't what you would want in in a in a family where you want to be shown love, you want to be shown that you are, you know, the most important person on the planet, mm. you know, or in this case there were three there were three of us in the end, three three siblings. Yeah, that wasn't there. But I know that now. I didn't know that at the time. So yeah. if I had, if I had, um, if I had something to talk about, for example, I was having some issues. And again, bearing in mind I was very young. But if I had issues at school, I couldn't go to dad. Mm. I couldn't go to mum. I probably couldn't go to my grandfather. 
And thinking back now, I probably didn't go to my gran, even though she loved me and she cooked and she did all of those things for me. I, 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 I had no one to really bounce any of the issues I was going through in life off. And, and, and that's something that is so important in a family if, if you know, no matter how, how young you are, I mean, obviously after, say, six or seven, if there are things that you need to talk to your parents about, you should be able to do that. And I didn't get the opportunity to do that. Mm. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was an un, it was, now it, I see it was an unusual situation and I think it probably had a, an effect on me. I'm, I'm sure it had an effect on me. But at the time it was great fun. Mm. It was great fun. Yep. So you mentioned that your mother was unwell through all of your childhood. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Mental illness, was it uh, depression? Yeah, uh, both. Well, yeah. yeah, 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 certainly. Depression was something that was certainly not talked about a lot. Mm. And 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 mum certainly, again, looking at it now, mum certainly had a significant form of depression. So there'd be times where she'd be good, and she was working at a place, uh, many of our listeners and, and viewers wouldn't know this particular department store, but she was working at a place called G&R Wills, which was a bit like John Martin's, a bit like um, David Jones, that sort of thing. So she had the ability to get through and work, but there were periods of time, and I remember this particularly when we left um, my grandfather and my grandmother and, and lived, lived as a family, there were times there, and, and it would go on for two or three weeks, where she was extremely unwell. She wouldn't be able to leave the house. She, she would ha- have anxiety attacks. I can remember, I can remember she'd, she'd call them uh, foofy attacks. So she, and this is probably 10 years further on, but when I was 17, 16, 17, and my father then bought a gym in Hindley Street and I was working for him, we'd get a phone call and it would be my brother and Rob would say, Mum's unwell, she's outside, she doesn't want to leave, she's up against the, the, the outside wall and she's having a foofy attack. And, I, and, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's humorous in a way, but it's sad in a way that all she was doing really was probably having an anxiety attack. Mm. And so she, she struggled all, all her life. I mean, she died at 62 of breast cancer, but she struggled all of her life with mental, mental illness and I didn't identify it back then. And I'm not even – I think Dad probably did – I'm not sure about my grandparents. I think sadly, and this is no disrespect to, 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 to my grandparents, I think probably they felt that she was just lazy mm. because when you, when you suffer depression, you get very, very down. You get uh, the world is, you know, there's a dark cloud over you. You get very tired, very unmotivated. Things that, that might not be a big issue are a big issue. You see them as a big issue. So there were, so as a result of mum's mental illness, even though she was working, she, for example, in those early days, very rarely cooked a meal. Mm. My grandmother always did that. Mum didn't clean the house. My grandmother did that. So those sorts of things. So she had, you're right, she had mental health issues, depression, and and that was treated in those days simply by, I mean, if you did take them to the doctor, by the doctor prescribing something like Valium. I mean, even shock treatment a bit later on in her life, but Valium. I mean, obviously, Valium is a, is a drug that relaxes you and makes you super tired. Mm. But you know, there are so many more drugs these days that you can that you can utilise that can help you with your mental health, and there are so many more facilities. Back in those days, of course, it was Glenside, um, and most of our viewers and listeners would be aware of Glenside. I mean, Mum was in and out of of Glenside, but yeah, she she suffered depression. Now, again, I keep saying, now I look back. And I see how much that affected the family. Yep. I mean, it's a worry. Mm. If someone doesn't have the, the right understanding, as I said, they feel as though she's being lazy rather than being unwell. Yeah. And obviously that caused a, a bit of friction between mum and my grandmother particularly. And I'm not sure, to be frank, and again, I don't mean this disrespectfully to my father, but I don't think dad understood what to do. Mm. And I think part of the reason that dad wasn't there for a greater period of the time that he he was married to mum, particularly from that time, I, I think that was the reason. I think he just thought, well, you know, hopefully she'll get better. It's a bit of an issue. Yep. Uh, I don't know how to handle it. And maybe the best way for me to handle it, as in my father, is to just do is to do what I do and, and, and try and distance myself from yep. it, which obviously is, is sad for mum, tough <clears throat> for dad, 
but I think it's very prevalent. Mm. I think a lot of people feel that way because they just don't know how to deal with someone who has depression. Yeah, definitely. So into your, into your teenage years, obviously when you're a bit younger, dad not being around much, mum being unwell, your teenage years, I'm assuming, would have been, you'd have had to grow up quickly, I'm assuming? Uh, yes, I'm not sure whether I did, but that was certainly something that I needed to do. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure how to. High school. Did you find that difficult? Not obviously, as you said before, not having the parents to talk to, mm. um, finding issues like that through high school? So we're talking probably, I don't know, 12, aren't we? 12, mm. 13, 14. Well, I left school. I left high school at 14. There was definitely signs that that I was following in mum's footsteps earlier than that. Mm. Uh, I can remember, and I have told this story before, and it sounds so twee and so insignificant, but but I can remember back when we were living with my grandparents, I must have been about eight or nine maybe. I can remember being at Glen Osmond Primary and there was a girl I liked and I was very shy. And, in fact, I still am very shy. And and I'm, I'm an introvert, which is weird considering the job I did, but I do prefer my own company. But I was very shy, particularly shy of girls, and I was very, very low in confidence, extremely low in confidence. In fact, just very briefly, I'll, I'll explain that I was so low in confidence, and, and, and I know this is – I don't want to be confusing here, but when I was about six or seven, my grandparents would take me to my grandmother's sister's place, so uh, my auntie, I guess, yeah, and there were times where I didn't want to get out of the car. Mm. I can remember vividly – liking this girl and it was near the end of maybe grade four or five i wasn't obsessed with her but i liked her and at the end of the year prior to the end of the year you are told what class you're going to be in the year after i wasn't sure whether she liked me but i sort of knew that she liked someone else maybe as well or only i don't know and at the end of the year when i found out that i wasn't going to be in her class and she was going to be in the class with that other guy, I got, I, and I can remember this vividly, I got really unwell. And, and I was off school for a week. I'm not sure whether it was a week, whether it was two or three days, but I feel as though it was a week. I was so unwell. I was so shattered. I was so upset that I couldn't go to school. Mm. So, I, I, so I guess, and I know I jumped back there, but it's important. I think that's, this is important. M my mental health issues... I feel started about then mm -hmm. because that, I think that's an, un, I don't know, maybe it's not, but I just felt it was so intense. And again, looking back at it now, I feel as though that was really totally over the top, but it's how I was. And I guess that has a lot to do with self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth, etc. So getting back to your question about my teens, when we shifted from, from uh, living with my grandparents and we moved on to Glen Osmond Road, Dad had just started working at the gym. So, again, we didn't see him a lot because he was working long hours. Mum was particularly unwell then. She wasn't working at all. I can remember having a day off from school. I had a cold. And I was, I was, I was doing some paper mache and I was making what I was hoping was going to be a doll, a ventriloquist doll, because I was into magic and ventriloquism in those days. And I was making the head, and I can remember blowing a balloon up and then putting the paper mache around the head, and then you deflate the balloon, and of course you've got a, a, a nice structure, and then yeah. you can work on it. You put the nose and the eyes on it. I can remember doing that, but I can remember bursting the balloon before the paper mache had dried. I thought it had dried, yeah. but it hadn't, and the head collapsed. Now, again, I know this sounds twee and it doesn't sound important, but when that happened, again, I became really unwell. Yeah. Which is maybe weird to a lot of people. Maybe maybe it's not. But I got so upset. I can remember now, I mean I'm 63 now. I would have been maybe maybe 11 then or something like that. But I can remember now the the the, the feeling in internally about how bad that incident or how I viewed that incident. I mean under normal circumstances you'd just do it again. Yeah. Blow up another balloon, but but it was so intense. Again, I became unwell. Yeah. So, I guess my mental health 
issues and the experience I uh, and the experiences I had when I was young mm. were those two, mm. the girlfriend and that. And again, I didn't know at the time, but I think back now, and I think that that both of them were total overreactions, but they were very deep. They mm. were very dark, and 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 they they both. They both destroyed my confidence. Mm. Now I'm sure I got over that, but I feel as though they were the two. They were the two issues that started, or at least indicated to me, Drew, that there was something mm. a little bit different. Mm. Unpleasant's not the right word. It was worse than unpleasant. Were they big issues? Now that I look back, no. But I, I know, and there's no getting away from the fact that they affected me greatly. Yeah. 50 odd years ago and you still remember the two so it's crazy well I do well I, and, and the reason I and the reason that I remember them is because I'm sort of talking about it now yeah and and I can remember doing an interview similar to this maybe three years ago before I went into rehab and I had to think about it when the when the person asking me they said you know what and and it became very it, mm. they were crystal clear crystal clear and when I talk about it and articulate it I can understand the significance of them in terms of, uh, you know, what I've been suffering for the for the rest of my life. Yeah. Now, you just mentioned rehab. Mm. Um, obviously, we're going to get into that. Prior to rehab, which was, I think, a few years ago, mm. you had a long, successful career in radio and television. You want to tell us a bit about your work career? Yeah, 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 yeah. So when I think about how I process things and when I think about the journey that I've had, and certainly the ups and significant downs that I've had. And when someone asked me a question about my media career, obviously I'm proud of it, but I sort of think to myself, how on earth did I do that for so long, given the mental health issues that, that I was dealing with? I started gambling at 14. I started drinking at 14. I started smoking dope at 14. And sure, I, I, I didn't and haven't done all of those things Every single day from there until I went into rehab, but nonetheless, it's it's an early it's an early time to start those things. As a result of the gambling, I I worked when I turned eighteen. I worked for a very dear friend of ours, Jim Eason, who was a bookmaker. So my life from fourteen, really, <clears throat> you know, for well, really for the rest of my life, but ha has been working either on the race course or with horses or gambling or whatever, and 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 that means that you deal with all of the peripheral stuff too. You deal with, you know, all those people who are involved in those industries. As a result of working at the races, I love the idea of calling races. Mm. I love the idea of calling races. So I started practising doing what you call phantom calls, probably younger than 18, but uh, and a phantom call is where you, it's not a, an actual race, but you just say, you just call the race in yeah. your head. And so people knew I could do that. Anyway, so I started working at the races. Obviously, as a result of that, I got to know a lot of the race callers. So my first job in the media was, I think it was when I was about 21, I started working for 5DN and I was there for 12 months calling mm. races. Mm -hmm. But you've got to remember I was still drinking and I was still smoking dope, not, mm. not while I was calling, but I was still <laughs> doing that and, 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 and all that sort of stuff. So it wasn't the ideal platform <clears throat> for a job where you really need a, a good memory. <laughs> Not at all, but I love doing it. Yeah, was I any good at it? No. Why wasn't I any good at it? Because I didn't commit. Because I had other things going on in my in my in my uh, my life. So I did that for about twelve months. But as a result of not doing it well, at the end of the twelve months, uh, Gary Bow, who was then the uh, program director at Five D, and rang me and said, "Look, we're going to let you go." Um, you know, you've done a good job, but we're going to head in another direction. So that was 1982. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. I then went to Darwin uh, with my dear friend Brad, and we were there for two years. Now is probably not the right time to tell you what exactly went on in those two years. <laughs> can only imagine. Well, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, we can, you know, maybe discuss whether we discuss that. 
on another podcast, but the second reason is I've got no idea. <laughs> I, have no, I have no clue. <laughs> I don't think anyone did have any clues. <laughs> anyway, so I spent two years up in Darwin, and I did a bit of race calling up there. I, did, I actually called the Greyhounds up there. I did some TV uh, coming straight from the casino. <laughs> you know, the Saturday Saturday night I'd get to the TV station about 10 o'clock and I'd be in my Hawaiian shirt and I'd do the Greyhound <laughs> show. Again, I have no idea. I have no, re- I have no recollection of that. I just read it. So I, I did some TV. I worked at the casino up there. I worked at a nightclub. I have sold advertising. So I did that for two years. And it was good fun, but it was very dark, really dark, mm. because there were no rules. But I loved it. And you can appreciate that, can't you? Mm. And, 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 of course, I was 24, 23, 24, 25. It was just great fun. Thank God my mother rang me on the hard line and said there's a job in the Australian, she'd read it in the, the Australian, she said there's a job in Adelaide at the ABC for a radio sports reporter. So, so the long and short of it is I applied for that job and got it. Mm. And that was in 80, late 80, late, uh, early 84. And I got it for six weeks. So I went down to Adelaide, left Darwin, it was great fun, but thank God I left Darwin because I probably wouldn't be here now if I had have stayed in Darwin. Worked for six weeks. I was so unconfident. I don't know. I'd never called football before, and yet in the end I, I, I ended up calling football, which I'm very proud of, mainly SANFL. I did some AFL, but mainly uh, SANFL. And so I got that job for six weeks. And then at the end of that six weeks, Drew, and Malcolm McDonald, who's no longer with us, and I owe him, really, I owe him my life as well to a large degree. He was our sports director mm-hmm. at the ABC. He gave me the opportunity to continue on. Now, that was in radio. We also had a newsroom, which was run by Grant Heading, or he was the chief of staff there. And Grant's a dear friend of mine now, and I, and I owe Grant so much. At that time, in 1984, there was no, it, it's different to now, there, there was a newsreader, but there was no sport reader, mm. and there was no weather presenter either. So Grant thought, do you want to do some TV? Or have, you got, have you done any TV? So I did a little bit of TV, as I told you, up in Darwin. So I showed him the tape. He said, look, I like that. He said, we might do something about that Hawaiian shirt. Probably doesn't work down in Adelaide. <laughs> and he said, you really need to get your hair right. He said, we'll probably use makeup and a lot of lighting. He said, would you like to, would you like to be involved in our news service and read the sport? And so I did that as well. So I was working in radio and TV. Now, I worked at the ABC until... 96. Then I went to Channel 10 mm-hmm. and was the sports presenter there and I was a reporter and I produced a bit as well and I love that. So I worked in newsrooms. And along the way I also did breakfast radio and I've done my own radio shows and stuff like that. And 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 that all finished as, as, uh, as, as quickly as it started really four years ago. So I did that for about 35, 40 years. I just want to say this. I'm very proud of what I did but I sort of feel as though I fell into it. You know, I have some dear friends in the media, you know, Tom Wren, who works at Channel 9, for example. I'm sure that Tom wanted to be a sports reporter, sports presenter, sports commentator from the age of five, six. I didn't. Sure, I wanted to be a a race caller, but that that ended quickly. But I I didn't grow up saying, I want to be in TV, Mm -hmm. I want to be a sports presenter, I want to be a commentator, I want to be a a reporter, I want to work in newsrooms. I, I didn't have that passion. And to be absolutely 100% honest, I think probably thinking back, for the 35, 40 years I was in the media, I'm not sure I was 100% totally passionate about it. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but I don't think it was necessarily, I'm getting up today because I'm a sports presenter, I'm a reporter, I've got my own radio show, and I love this. I happen to be good at it. Yeah. Well, I say good, and I, I mean that humbly. I, of course, there are better, of course. I happen to be pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. And I was comfortable and, you know, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but, I mean, you, you do, after a while, you do get paid well for it. Yep. So it's not a difficult job. It's not like you're working, you know, on the roads and with respect to it, people who do that or perhaps people who are working in department stores who are getting $30 an hour. And, I, again, I mean no disrespect, mm. none whatsoever. I mean, I'm working at La Trattoria at the moment, you know, the pizza pizza shop. I do eight hours a week. It's not a difficult job for the money if you've been in it for a while and you mm. become a presenter and a commentator and do your own show. It's not a bad job for the money you get. Mm. I enjoyed it, but I never really felt that it was sort of absolutely what I wanted to do. 
I'm not sure what I wanted to do. I still don't really know what I want to do, but it wasn't an absolute passion. I just fell into it. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand that I appreciate 100% how wonderfully lucky I was to have done it. And if I pass tomorrow, I can look back and say, you can be proud of what you did. You, you did it well. If I had my time again, I, I'm not sure that would have been the direction I would have taken. Does that make sense? No, it does. Does it yeah. make sense? I mean, it sounds odd because I think most people would think he must have wanted to do. He must have wanted to have done that from the age of five, and he's got his dream job. I'm not knocking the job at all. Mm. I'm just saying I'm very, very, very fortunate to have done it, and I'm un, I'm uneducated. I'm not the smartest, you know, smartest guy around. I have my issues. You know, I've made a lot of mistakes, will continue to. I've made some bad mistakes. And I think if you put all of that in one bucket and then say, but you did that, it sort of makes me feel a bit better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Nothing to do with the profile, nothing to do with the fact that people recognise me. I wasn't interested in that at all. But it, it's just at least I can hang my hat and say, you know what, for 35, 40 years you did that pretty well. Yeah. And, and that makes me feel good. Definitely. So in a general sense, that's – I know that was a long-winded way of answering it, but in a general sense, that's how – my career started, and then, as I said, it ended four years ago. So four years ago, that career ended as quick as it started. Do as you we mentioned. really need to bring this up? <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned about some issues. Tell us and the viewers a bit about, you said some issues. Yeah, what, well, what? well, we've touched on those, obviously, with the mental health issues mm. and the drinking when I was working, occasional use of marijuana. Obviously, that was significant when I was younger. And by the way, I think probably using marijuana when I was young certainly affected my mental health. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the alcohol did as well. I guess, and this is important, for a long time, and look, you know, I got married and, and I still love my beautiful wife to this day and, and we're not together anymore, which is extremely sad for me, but it was it was horrendous for her and I'm I'm terribly, terribly, terribly sorry about that. I really am. It's just, it's horrible. I, I, I find it very difficult not to feel really, really deep pain for, for, for Judith. But I have a beautiful daughter, you know, I have a brother and sister, two or three good friends. But I guess particularly the last 15 years, I was probably, because I was in a very high-profile position, I was wearing a mask. So I was unwell, but I was wearing a mask. And I'm not sure whether you've done that before. I'm, I'm not sure. Mm. Have you? Yeah. Okay. So you, you understand what I'm saying. Definitely. So I, I was wearing a mask. In other words, there were times, and, and those times became longer and longer, where I was just finding it difficult to cope. I was earning a lot of money, don't get me wrong. And again, I, I mean that respectfully. I was driving a nice car, living in a nice house. You know, I could, went for holidays, all of that stuff. But that was totally irrelevant. It was totally irrelevant. I was just becoming more and more unhappy. And as a result of that, I was drinking more. I sort of wasn't smoking a lot of dope in the latter stages. I certainly wasn't using cocaine at that stage. I was finding it more and more difficult, Drew, to keep the mask on. You know, initially I'd bolted on with a, with a couple of bolts up the top and it'd sit nicely. But after a while I had to bolt it on with two or three, you know, metaphorically speaking, <clears> I had to <throat> bolt it on so that, so that I wasn't really that worried about whether people knew or not. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't really worried about that. I was just worried about myself doing the job and – getting it done and being professional and knowing that it's a high-powered job and you've got to report and you've got to present and you've got to look your best and you've got to make, you know, when people meet you in the street, it's, hi, Mark, how are you going? I love what you do or whatever it might be. Yeah, hi, how are you going? Big smile. That became more and more difficult. That became more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I started drinking more and then it got to a point where I was irresponsible I was taking risks, and in the end, my job at Channel 10, something needed to happen, mm -hmm. and and as a result of that, I left Channel 10, and it was very upsetting for everyone. Obviously, it was upsetting for me, but it was upsetting for the, for the people at Channel 10 who had to tell me. It was upsetting and very irresponsible of me to have done what I did, but it was, it was, it was, it was really irresponsible. It was really upsetting for my workmates. Yeah. Because it disrupted the newsroom, it was it was it was terrible for my friends, and I guess, and I, I mean this in an egotistical way, but it was also it was also upsetting for people who knew of me. I guess they'd grown up with me, and and so that was that was really that was really very messy and 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 extremely painful and extremely difficult. So I lost my job at Channel Ten, 
12 months later, I lost my job at 5AA and then just after that, Judith found it really difficult and, and we, we, we parted. And then I started living by myself for two years and that was a disaster because I started using cocaine then because it made me feel better. I drank more. Uh, I smoked dope. I was being irresponsible. I was making bad choices. I wasn't working. I was going through the money that I had. But when you're in that dark place, and again, I don't know, same? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can relate. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. When you're in that dark place, sure, your best mate's saying, I'm a bit worried about you. Your sister's saying, I'm a bit worried about you. You know, um, uh, others are saying they're a bit worried about you, but you don't see that. And so, and so that... That went on for two years, and and it was it was hell, really. I mean, I don't particularly want to go into any specifics. Only to say that, you know, it got to the point where, if I was thinking clearly enough, I thought, it, 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 you know, and again, I, I I'm very careful of the language I use, but it's I got to, it got to the point where I thought, you know, it, uh, is this really worth it? You know, is, is this really worth it? I thought of that when I was straight. Not when I was high. I thought of that when I was straight, and I wasn't straight very often. And of course, when you're straight after you've been high, you're very down mm -hmm. as a result of the drugs and the alcohol and the, and the marijuana. Because unfortunately, as you know, and as others would know, the high is great, but there's a significant low. And so when I was in that low, but I was thinking clearly, if that makes sense, there were times where I thought, you know, is this worth it? And that's all I'll say on that. And you can read between the lines. And, uh, and that went on for two years. And that was basically, you know, I mean, I've been clean for two years now. So it was basically two years ago. I mean, that went on for two years. Mm -hmm. Some people go through that all their life. Yeah. Some people go through that all their life. Yeah. I wasn't motivated to get a job. I was unreliable. Uh, I was aggressive. But I, I, I don't mean aggressive as in physically aggressive. I was verbally aggressive. Yeah. And, 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 and at the time, I, I, I didn't see that. But now I look back and I feel a lot of shame about that. I feel a lot of shame about what happened prior to that. I feel a lot of sh And that's what I'm dealing with at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, shame, remorse. Guilt. Uh, or, guilt, all of those mm -hmm. things. That's why it's always, it's always, it, it's always a day-by-day -day thing. I mm -hmm. mean, as I said, I've been clean from drugs and alcohol now for, for, for two years. I'm still working on other stuff as yeah. in other parts of my life, but I still have that guilt and that shame. Mm. So that was two years of, of being in the darkest possible hole. It was wet. It was humid. It was, it was clammy. It was just, it was just an awful, awful part of my life. Mm. And it was difficult for people who knew me. So what changed? What, what the two years of being in the darkest place of your life, what was the moment, the light bulb moment that made you think oh, something's got to give? What, 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 what was it? Again, I preface the, this story by saying I'm still working on things. Yeah, of course. So yeah. I'm not saying that that light bulb moment came and then all of a sudden everything was great. I think that's really important to, to, to let people know. I mean, it might be different for others. But uh, my, my dear friend Brad and my sister contacted me and said, why don't we go, go and have a, have a meal down at Glen Earl, a nice seafood restaurant down there. So I went down and Kathy was there. So I knew why they were there. And, and the thing that you've got to remember this too, Drew, it's that some people, some people are in denial. I, I've never been in denial. I've never been in denial. If you had said to me three years ago during that two-year period, mate, this is not going well, I wouldn't have said to you, yes, it is, everything's fine. I, if you had really nailed me, I would have said, no, I know it's going badly. And it's really, this is really turning to shit. But I still would have continued on. Mm -hmm. Some people are in denial. That's another conversation for another day. I've never been in denial. So they took me down to the restaurant and obviously in a very general sense, no, not general sense, in a very specific sense, they said, we're very worried about you. So there was no, what are you talking about? Get out of my face. Leave me alone. Uh, you know, I'll run my own. None of that. So I'm very blessed that... I've got to be proud of myself that at least I accepted that. Yeah. And they said, what can we do? And I said, oh, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. I need to stop. I mean, there's so many things I needed. I needed a job. I needed to get up early in the morning so that I had some sort of, you know, some sort of mission for the day. I, I, I needed to get off everything. I needed to, I needed to change so many things. It was very overwhelming, no question about that. But I said, 
oh, I, I just don't know. And they said, what about rehab? And so at the end of the meal, we all went home and I'd agreed that I would go to rehab. I didn't know where, but I'd agreed. So that night I got on, I got on the, the computer, looked at four or five places around Australia and, and overseas and then sent some emails out. Yeah. So the next morning I went to the park with Jack, my beautiful puppy dog at that time. I have Toby now. Um, and uh, I was at the park, my phone rang, and it was a guy called Jackson Oppie who ran the Hater Clinic mm-hmm. in Melbourne. Now, he must have known me. Maybe he knew me from TV. I did a bit of national stuff there. So he, he must have known me. But anyway, that, that, I'm not sure why I say that, but I guess the point I'm making is he, 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 he just knew a bit about my background, my yep. media background. So it wasn't as if he was ringing a random – I say a random. I don't mean that disrespectfully either. It wasn't as if he was ringing someone who, who he knew nothing about. Mm-hmm. So he, he rang and we spoke for probably 40, 50 minutes, maybe an hour. I probably cried for 80% of that time because he was extremely powerful and motivational and to the point. Yep. Like there was no mucking around. He yep. wasn't saying, look, you know, how's it going? I mean, you know, he, he – because I, obviously I told my story as the conversation started. So there was no, oh, that's okay, that'll be fine. It was none of that. He was saying things like, continue this and you'll be dead in two years. Continue yeah. that and you'll lose your family. Well, obviously my marriage had fallen apart, but you'll, you'll lose your sister or, or, or your brother. They'll, 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 they'll wipe you uh, or whatever. Or, or continue that and you'll be in jail because you'll hit someone while you're driving, mm. uh, you know, uh, inebriated or, you know, uh, on drugs. So there's no mucking around here. So we spoke for, we spoke for an hour. The next day... I flew to Melbourne. We were, I arrived at nine o'clock in the morning. Within half an hour, I was in his car and we were driving down to Geelong. So the Hater Clinic has two facilities, one in Geelong, which is really tough, and then their other facility, which is, is in Essendon. So he took, which I'm very, very grateful, he took personal responsibility for me. He made sure that I turned up. He made sure that I got in the car. He made sure that he drove me down. He made sure that I walked into the door. He made sure that I registered. He made sure that I stayed there. So within, as I say, within, you know, 24 hours, I was registered at the Hayter Clinic. I can, I can remember going to sleep the first night, you know. Oh, you had a room, bed, nice little dining table, no phones, you know, no laptops, Yeah, you know, in bed by 10. Uh, TV only on from five till ten. I mean, all that. This was in Essen. It was a little bit looser in. in uh, th- th- that was in Geelong. It was a bit looser in Essen, and and uh, I can remember putting my head down, Drew, on the on the on the bed, and and thinking two things. And you can probably guess one of them. The first is what the hell is going on? Yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, four years ago I was saying to Rebecca Moores, thanks, Rebecca, hi, everyone, first to football and, uh, you know, the Adelaide Crows have won their <laughs> third game in a row. Four years later I'm putting my head down on a pillow in a house full of, t- of uh, 20 people, some businessmen, some a- a- and addicts of all types, uh, some people who are homeless, some people who have just been in prison, I mean, honestly, yeah. sex addicts, gambling addicts. Uh, shopping addicts, ice addicts, alcoholics. A- a- and so I put my head down and I'm thinking, what, I- what? What has happened here? Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free. And you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. But I also thought to myself, this is good. This is good. Hmm. This is what I needed. And this is the rebranding. Not rebranding, you know what I mean. The, the restart hmm. for me to get well, to be responsible, to be a good father, to be a good friend, to be a good work colleague, um, you know, to be a good friend to my former wife, to do the right thing, to give back. Mm-hmm. Now, 
I've got to make it perfectly clear, I'm working on all of those. Am I really good at all of those things at the moment? No, I'm not. So I have to be really clear there. I don't want this to sound as though, go to rehab, everything's fine. It's not. <laughs> it's not for me. Yeah. It's not for me. I'm still working on stuff, and I know I'm still making mistakes. And I know that there are people out there who some say, well done, Mark. Others are saying, no, don't trust him. And I understand that. I, I, I understand that, and, I, I, you know, that is fine. It's human nature. Mm. Yeah, you've done well, Mark, but, you know, you know, I mean, obviously I've been trying to get a job for two years. And I'm sure that some people, when I put my application in, have gone, no, Mark, great presenter, went public with all of this stuff. Uh, not really sure we'll take a risk. I understand that, and I have uh, – uh, uh, that's fine. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, that that's how people – if that's how people want to think, no problem. Maybe they're right. I don't know. Mm. So I have no control over that. So I just want to make the point, because I do not want under any circumstances, Drew, to be sitting here and for people to think, wow, Mark, you've got this by the the scruff of the neck. I haven't. I'm still working on it. Mm. I'm a lot better, but I can be a lot better. Do you understand what I mean? Definitely. I I, I just, I'm really, really big on this because I'm still making mistakes. Am I using drugs and alcohol? No. And I'm coming up to two years, and I'm very proud of that. Yes, Are there sure other be. issues that I've got that I need to work on? Yes, a whole range of things because it's ongoing. Mm. It is ongoing, and I just want to make that absolutely perfectly clear. So anyway, that that's mm. that was the the tipping point. Going back to your point, the tipping point mm. really was that meal. It was a lovely meal, actually. We had calamari. You ever had calamari? <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful calamari. I should have had a calamari. Calamari, and my sister made sure that I had a a, a soda water. And I've actually had soda water ever since. In fact, I feel as though I've got shares in soda in, in a soda water business. So that was the tipping point. Yeah. And the experience in in the rehab centre was enlightening, tough, hard, depressing occasionally, but so worth it. And and I've been drug free, alcohol free ever since. I'm still working on stuff. And it's onward and, onwards and upwards, to use a, a real corny cliche, and it has to be. Mm. It has to be. There is no other option. Mm-hmm. It has to be. But yeah. it's a day by day. You know this. Yeah, one day. Day by day. Hour by hour. Sometimes minute by minute thing. Yep. Uh, as I was taught, um, recovery, it's not a destination, it's a journey. Absolutely. You know what Absolutely. I mean? yeah, and it really is a... It's a better cliche than mine. I thought mine was very corny. <laughs> it's certainly one day at a time, something I hold on to quite a lot. Yeah. Just really... Well, your story is very inspirational mm, too. Keep it in the day. In fact, 100 days for you? 101 today. Yeah, 100 days yesterday. So, so well done. That, that's yeah. so important. Honestly, that's... Do you appreciate that? Oh. Do you really appreciate that? De- definitely. It's a big thing. Oh, it's... Yeah. How's your family feel? I know it's your interview, but I'm just asking you this. How does your but family I think feel? They're happy. Yeah, no, nah, they're, they're yeah. They must be very proud of you, mate. Definitely the uh, sober, clean and sober Drew's a lot better person than the um, active addict Drew. So. And, and as you said, it's a day by day thing. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, I've only got my sobriety for today. Correct. Yeah, so. and, and, and just on that, and I do a little bit of talking, a little bit of talking, a little bit of public speaking, a little bit of hopefully motivational stuff for clubs, a little bit of stuff for the government, a little bit of stuff for organisations. I never get up there and say this is it for me. I'm fine. I never do that. I never do that because tomorrow I may not be. That's right. But the other thing I never do is I never get up and say, don't take drugs, don't take alcohol, don't take Coke, don't do that. I never do that either. And the reason I don't do that is because it's not my place to say that. Mm. What I do say, though, is I say, do that. Go for it. No worries. That's the journey I went down. But just be aware of this is what happened to me as a result of it getting out of hand. I'm not saying if you do all of that stuff, it's going to get out of hand. Mm. All I'm saying is this is where it can head. Yep. If you want to go through that, you go for it. But let me tell you, it's pretty pretty damn bad. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty damn bad. It might not be as public as mine, Yeah. but it's pretty bad. Yeah. I've been public with my journey as well, not to um, demonise drinking or drug take. I've got lots of mates, uh, well, most of my mates probably still drink, mm. take drugs, mm. but you know, not everyone's an addict. Not everyone's an alcoholic. No, you know what I mean. No, so, my beautiful, beautiful former wife. She could have, she she could have half a glass of red, mm. half a glass. Mm. She put the other half back in the bottle. What's going on there? Yeah. What's going on there? Why couldn't uh, I do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bless her heart. Um, so you mentioned you're coming up to two years. Mm. So 
I mean, well done. That's, Thanks. That's unreal. Two years clean and sober. Thank that's, you. Um, that's unreal. So recovery in general, mm. is he just still working on things? What does Mark Aston do as part of his recovery? Like, is there, are mm. you involved in, do you, do you, do you see someone professionally or do you, what, 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 what's what makes up like? your recovery program? Yeah. What's it look like? So again, I'm working on this. So yep. the template started two years ago. The template's always, always changing. And, I, and again, I just have to make this point. I keep falling back. Mm. I keep, I, not not from a using point of view. I just keep falling back. But I get. But I guess the key is I pick myself up. Mm-hmm. I have challenges. Instead of letting that challenge overwhelm me, I say, okay, someone. I'm not necessarily religious, but someone is testing me, and that's fine. I'll get over that hurdle. Yep. Whereas when you're in a dark place, it's just too much. Yeah. And then you start using again. Yeah. So in a but it, just. In a very general sense, I'm trying to keep myself as healthy as I can. Yeah, I'm on medication, which is which is very valuable to me. I'd prefer not to be, but I am. I see a psychologist. Yep. as often as I need to. Yep. Um, I constantly remind myself how, and this will sound weird, but how lucky I am. I'm living with my sister. I have a pillow. I have, I have a bed. I have a room. I have a dog. I have an old Audi. That's okay. Uh, not like the cars I used to drive, but I have a car, I have clean sheets, I have a desk, things like that. I'm appreciative of, really appreciative. So I, I have, I have. Hopefully, and I'm still working on this. I'm trying to work on my gratitude. The other thing I'm trying to work on, I say try. You either do or you don't. The other thing I'm working on is to be more organised during the day. Now, up until recently, I haven't had a full time job. That's about to change, but. When you don't have a full-time job, it's easy to drift. It's easy to get up at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's easy to say, I'm going to do this because I have a small little business on the side, a media training business, PR business, that sort of stuff. But when you're working for yourself and you're working through all of these other things, it's not like, okay, well, tomorrow morning I get up at 6, I do this at 6 till 7, then I do this at 7 till 8, then I do from 8 till 12, I do this, I do my email. That sounds easy. But it's not easy when you're not used to it. You've got to remember, I worked for 40 years where other people were running my life. Yeah. So I'm working on that because that's very, structure is very important. Mm. Structure and having a reason to get up in the morning is really important. I love my dog. My dog is – Toby is my life. Mm. I have uh, – Toby is my life. I'm not ready for a relationship because I'm still sorting things out and, and I know it'll sound weird. But for all the rubbish that I went through two years ago – for all of that rubbish or four years beyond four years and around that two years, I do look at that as a gift. And the reason I say that is because if it hadn't happened then, it would have happened soon. It would have happened next week or next month or next year, or it might be happening now, which means at 63, 64, it's further down your life track. At least it happened then. It's given me a bit of time to get well, to get organised, to hopefully gain respect from others, which I'm still working on. Yep. There are people I haven't apologised to who I would like to, um, which I haven't done yet, it just gives you more time. So I know that sounds weird, but when it happened, I'm glad it happened then and it didn't happen today. Because if it happened today, we wouldn't be doing this. We might be doing this in four years' time and I'd be 68 years of age. So I see that as a gift. I have to learn from it. And and and, and, I, and, and, and in answering your question, I, 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 also, I, I, I do some stuff for charity. Obviously, I do some paid stuff, but I do some stuff for charity, and that keeps me well grounded. Well, overall, it sounds like you're in a pretty good place. Well, I'm in a, be- I, I'm in a better place. Yeah. I'm in yeah. a better place. Yeah. That's not, a good thing, I, though. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm yeah. in a better place. Yeah. I want to be in a better place again. Of course. And that's taking time. Yeah. But I'm in a better place than where I was two years yeah. ago, and it's a journey. Yeah. Mate, it's a journey. It you is. know that. It's yeah. a journey, and the journey doesn't finish until we say goodbye to this world. That's right. It, it doesn't. What advice would you give to someone that may be <clears throat> thinking to themselves, shit, I've really got to do something about my drinking, my drug taking, or whatever my, it is. my mental health in mm, general? Mm. What what would you what advice would you give to someone mm. to I suppose inspire them to take that first step. So what happened with me as we know is my sister and my best mate came to me. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky enough to have that situation occur, 
please take it. Please take it. See it as, again, as a gift. Please take it. But if it's not... And it's not, and it might not be for a number of reasons. One is that you, you know, you're hiding it well, or you're just unapproachable, or you're in denial. All I ask is that if you feel as though you can seek help, and I know that sounds so basic. I know it sounds so basic, but just seek help. Either see your doctor, either see a psychologist, or even, even, even more raw than that. Speak to your parents, speak to your spouse, speak to your brother, speak to your friend and discuss it. At least that's a good start. <clears throat> Look, I think I was probably ready to, 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 to change. But some people aren't. And so what I'm advising is difficult because you might not see it. But just give yourself some time when you're straight to think about where you're at, think about where you want to be, think about where you might be if you continue on this, this line and if you're worried about it, and if you're concerned, and if you see it getting worse, and if you see things really falling apart, speak to someone. And that will possibly instigate, and you might not take my journey, but that will instigate some, some form of help. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is if you speak to someone and they know that you're willing to speak and willing to open up and willing to admit and willing to take responsibility, they'll help you more. They'll get others to help you. And if you've, and a lot of people are very, they're very insular, they're very by themselves, and that's a problem. I, I agree. But if you've got a family or a friend, reach out. Secondly, if you see someone who is heading in the wrong direction, I feel this is a bit stronger. I feel as though you have a responsibility to at least sit them down, not aggressively. Not uncomfortably, but as we did prior to this, we just sat down and have a coffee. And in a nice way, me saying to you, for example, if I was doing this, not saying, man, I'm really worried about you, but saying, how are you? Mm. Everything okay? Yeah, not too bad. Are you sure? Is, is there anything? So it's, it's that type of approach. So if you're unwell, seek help. Seek counsel from someone. That will start the process. If you see someone in that situation... I feel as though it is your obligation to at least have a chat. You don't have to sit them down. You can see them in the corridor or whatever, but just see how they are because if they're wearing the mask like I was and maybe you pick something up and some people at work were picking things up, but if you pick up a small thing but they're wearing that mask, it's easy for them to deflect that. It's easy for you to think, no, he's okay or she's mm -hmm. okay. But if they're wearing the mask as well as I did, they'll be doing a good job at hiding something that in the end can turn turn into a, a – turn into something that is just inconceivable yeah, and, and almost life-threatening and certainly affects a lot of other people. I, 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 Yes, this is serious, but, you know, I have a good sense of humour and I try and see the funny side of this. Yeah, I mean, not that I go to sleep every night and say, oh, wasn't that funny that I ended up losing my job at Channel 10 and then I ended up in the rehab. I sort of don't go, ah, oh, that's really funny. But I'm still alive. Yeah. If you don't I'm, laugh, I'm, you cry. I'm still alive. That's that. Now that's a corny one, <laughs> but I'm still alive, and yeah. I and that's yeah. you can't beat that. Well, Mark, that uh, that was very uh, brave of you, I think, to share what you what you just have over the last hour. Um, a lot of a lot more people are doing it. Yeah. Thanks I, for using the word brave, but again, I feel a bit uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Because but, I'm a, because I'm a public figure, and because people know. It, 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 thank you, but. There's a lot of other people who are who are brave in doing. I mean, you're brave in, in doing what you're doing, and, and just quickly, people are brave in just telling their friends. Definitely, and and I really think that by you sharing your story. I mean, I, I remember reading the article. There was an article about you yeah. going to rehab. I think that was just before I went to rehab. Yes, and and it was very well written, by the way. I, I must say, I, I trusted the journalist that did it, uh, and she she did a very good job. I think just by showing that vulnerability, it really does open the door for others to. To, to disarm them and really think that it's okay for them to, to put their hand up and say, I'm not going too well, I need help. So And they're not alone. That's right. Oh, you're not, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, uh, that's an important point. Yeah, yeah, so I really thank you for sharing your story. Thanks, mate. Being so open and honest. I've actually got a... Huh. It's not a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine little, if it was a really nice bottle of... Or a little bag. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a little, or a uh, joint. 
I mean, uh, you got you got to laugh. I got a recovery project hoodie there for oh, you. Oh, mate, thank you. It's so, a hoodie. It's a hoodie. Fantastic. Yeah. Actually, I might use this because just recently I've been going around uh, stealing stuff from home. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, that's very kind of you. Actually, yeah. I should just put that up there. Hang on, let me just get that. It's very awkward of me. That's isn't that lovely? Yeah. So yeah, that's a thank you, mate. That's very kind of, of you. Thank you so for what is so. Uh, this is part of what you're doing. Well, yeah, this it? is the little little project I've decided to uh, kick off. Where recovery project? No, hang on. Is it recovery the, project? The recovery project. Real people, real stories, real recovery. Good so, on you, mate. Yeah, it's something I think stories like your, uh, yours, and hopefully to get a few other people on and just share their stories to really hopefully inspire change in others, or yeah, let people know that they're mm. not alone in this journey because. Um, as I've said, it's a journey, not a destination. Mm. And, you know, 101 days for myself now, you're nearly two years. It's, I mean, some days you think you're going backwards, it's getting harder. But yeah. The yeah. main thing is we're not alone. And, yeah, I really, really appreciate your time today, Mark. So thanks. Thank you, mate. And congratulations for, for your 101 days. Well done. Thank thanks, you. Mate. Cheers. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.